Hello. Alain Fournier. Le Grand. Just a second. Le Grand Moulne. Le Grand Moulne. Before I get started with the review, if you like the videos and you've got a little extra money and you would like to leave me a tip to say thanks for making the videos for free, here's a little money just to say thanks. You can. There should be some links down below where you can become a member and you can give a little money in return. I will say thank you. Le Grand Moulin is, oh, it's, it's very difficult to, to describe this novel because it really took me by surprise. It, maybe if I, if I begin to tell you the plot, some ideas will begin to coagulate. There is a little boy, he's 15 years old. What is his name? I think his name is Francois. And he is the son of the local schoolmaster of the village. So he goes to the classroom where he is taught by his father. And then his father teaches the older children, I think they're all boys, and his mother teaches the younger children in the house that they live in. Because it's a tiny village and it's in, I think the story takes place in about 1890, ancient. And life for this little boy is rather dull. He goes to school with his father, he goes to his room. But then one day, a new student arrives. His mother asks the schoolmaster, Francois's father, can this young man stay with you? I will pay you money and he will be a boarder for you. And this is Augustine Mühlen, the main character of the novel. And he is a little bit older. He's 17 years old. He's quite tall. He seems to embody the spirit of adventure. Very quickly, all the local boys in this village at the school, you know, he becomes their leader, you know, because he, he's tall and he's filled with this spirit of, of just something. Like when you're with him, something's going to happen. Now, Francois, he is extremely happy about this turn of events because this boy is living with him. Like they share the same bedroom. This is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to this, this family. One day, not very long after the boys arrived, Augustine, he hears that the, um, the schoolmaster, um, I forget what his name is, Francois, Francois's father, I, I think it's Sorel, Monsieur Sorel, his parents are coming to stay with them for the holidays. Moulin, hearing this, he decides that he's going to have a little adventure. He's going to go to one of the local, like the, I think the local blacksmith, and he's going to ask to borrow his horse because he's got a fast horse. And he's going to hitch up the horse and he's going to take it to the train station because he's going to get there faster than anyone else. And it will be a big surprise that this tall foreign boy picks up the grandparents and brings them back quicker than anyone else can. That will be his adventure for the day. For some reason, he, he falls asleep in the, um, in the cart. And when he wakes up, the horse has taken him to some other village. Like he has no concept where he is. It's many, many hours later. He has, he, he doesn't even know which direction they've gone. He's nowhere close to the train station. That's for sure. So he goes wandering. He's looking just for, um, you know, someone, please, could I, could I sleep here? I'm freezing cold and I haven't eaten anything for hours and hours. Is there a place where I can put my horse? And this is really the rural nowhere land like even to see a house is you know there are just there's nothing there's fields farmers fields for all the eye can see he finds a house and they they take him in and it just so happens that in this house they are in the midst of a massive party that is getting ready for this wedding that's about to take place so many people have been invited from the local countryside and from paris that he just gets mixed in with everyone else. And so he quickly cleans himself up and he says, oh, this is a good opportunity. I'll get, you know, lots to eat because, you know, there's always lots of eating at a wedding party. He mixes in with the group and he's, he's keeping his ears open to who's getting married, to whom, and how he can kind of remain at this wedding party undetected, maybe for two or even three days, you know, if the food's good. And while he's at this party, he sees this woman who he um, falls in love with, a woman, a girl. He's 17 and she's maybe 15 or 16. Falls in love with her. They meet and they talk. And he says, I love you. 
And she says, don't be foolish, you're just a boy. You know, you don't even know my name. He says, it doesn't matter. Love, I feel it. And it's just for a moment. And she says, please leave me alone. Don't, don't keep talking to me because, you know, everybody's looking and, and it'll cause a scene if you keep trying to talk to me like this. But I'll talk to you before you leave. But suddenly the, the wedding party comes to a sudden unfortunate ending that the, um, the wedding between the bride and the groom is called off quite dramatically. So the wedding party is just over. Everybody packs up very quickly and, and leaves because it's not good to hang around when the wedding's been called off so awfully. And in all the chaos of people packing up and, and getting ready to leave and leaving in a very quick hurry, Augustine is running around saying, which direction are you going? Is anybody going close to this village of, you know, where I live? Is anybody going in this direction? And someone says, I am, but you've got to jump in quickly because I'm leaving right away. And so he does. And he doesn't get any time to say goodbye to this woman he's in love with. So he goes back to his village. He, he falls asleep again because he's been up for two or three nights in a row, just dancing and, and having this wedding festival. So he falls asleep in the cart again. Eventually he gets back to his tiny village. He has no idea where he's been. You have to know that, that you know, the world was such a different place in 1890 that there were no buses, there were no cars. I think in the village, only one of the boys has a bicycle. It's like having a spaceship, you know, in terms of luxury and speed and modernity. So he tries to figure out which direction he went in so he could get back to that village to see this girl that he's in love with. And he tries to put the pieces of the puzzle together, but something happens that he has to go back to Paris to be with his family. He doesn't forget though, he still nourishes this love, this young teenage infatuation that he has with this girl because he, he's going to ask her to, to get married. If he could just find her, if he could just find where she lives and get back to this village, but he can't, he doesn't know. He knows that he goes on that road, but you know, when he comes to the crossroads, he thinks you go to the left, but it may be to the right. And then from there, after that, he has no idea which way to go to get to this town. So that is really quite magical. Now, Francois, he's really quite upset when Augustine goes to Paris because now his friend is gone and that pretty much means no more adventures. But he keeps trying, like he remembers this adventure of how much Augustine wanted to, to find this girl again. And Francois also keeps working on this. Like he thinks that he will be doing his friend the greatest thing ever. If he can find this girl for him, he'll write him, he'll write him a letter in Paris, say, I found her because his life is boring. He's got nothing else to do. He'll probably go on to be a local school teacher in the next village over the same as his father was, you know, that, like that, that is his future prospects for the rest of his life. So this adventure, it occupies his mind. He wants to, to help his friend. Like it will be the culmination of this great big dream that it feels the two of them have been living together. And he does find her and he writes to Augustine in Paris. And he says, come back. I can introduce you to her because I know who she is and I know where she is. Now, I'm not giving away too much of the novel. I promise you I would not do that. But what do you think happens next? Does Augustine go back to meet this girl that he had this like overwhelming infatuation with? How can he help himself? Like, of, of course he has to. But what happens on their second meeting? Like, will the love have survived all of this absent time? Like, they met during a, a wedding party. Maybe now on their second meeting, the, the magic just won't be there anymore. Maybe the romance was just a, a one night affair. Now that they're seeing each other once again, maybe it just, it won't be there. Maybe it will. I'm not going to tell you. But that is not, that is not the climax of the novel at all. When Augustine comes back to meet Yvonne, you know, this, this woman of mystery that is just, what's the word? Like he, he's enthralled to the memory of this woman that he believes he has this, you know, the great love for this girl. Maybe it's true. Maybe it was just a fantasy. Maybe it was just, you know, the ephemeral magic of one evening at a wedding party. You know, the magic is in the air. 
This book is magical. Like it really goes back to another time in literature when people really cared about telling a story that was quite, you know, it was a story that built and the developments in the plot were quite unexpected. Like there were two moments, maybe three moments in the novel that I could not believe what had just happened. The way that the situation changed was so incredible. Like I, I had no, I'm not the kind of reader who's always sort of, you know, thinking two steps ahead, like, oh, you know, probably this will happen or maybe this will happen. I tried to enjoy the, the beauty of the language and the craftsmanship of the, the writing, even in translation. And I should say the translator. This one was translated by Frank Davison. There you go. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate your work. This is one of the beautiful old novels. It might not be for everyone because it is written about a lost world. Perhaps people can't even imagine anymore. While I was reading this, I kept, I kept wondering, like, what is this novel reminding me of? Like, it's reminding me of something. Like, there's something about this novel. Like, it's, it's quite a, like a boyhood love and adventure story. They're young men and they're trying to, to have some adventure. And this one special boy ends up at a wedding party and he falls in love with this girl. Wow, excitement. Like, I really couldn't think of anything that it would actually compare to it. It's something very, very much in the vein of um, uh, Balzac and Zola. Yeah, probably because it's French, you know, so I have those associations there. But it's so nice to read this book because this book was written before the invention of the teenager. And I'm not saying that ironically, I'm, I'm saying that in truth, that the concept of the teenager didn't really exist until America in the 1950s, maybe 40s, but mostly the 50s, that the teenager, as we know the species today, was a development of society that we began to place all of these um, societal rules and expectations and, and prejudices against these people of this category. But in the 1920s and the 1910s and the 1800s, teenagers didn't exist. You were a child and then you were an adult and there was nothing in the middle, which is very much unlike today where you're a child and then you're a teenager, pretty much well into your 30s, people still behaving like teenagers, dressing like teenagers, eating like teenagers and living their lives like teenagers. I think the teenager mentality and way of life has just completely taken over society in North America that even when you speak to adults, like I used to rent an apartment from a man who was in his 60s and he would drive me crazy because he would always be talking about these movies like Star Wars and Indiana Jones and Game of Thrones and I'd look at him and I'd be like, how old are you, man? Why are you so obsessed with this really juvenile bullshit? Even, you know, even the people I watch on YouTube, like when they do their movie reviews, you know, they take Star Wars films very seriously. Like it is this grand cultural statement, but it's nothing, guys. It's just fucking bubblegum. It's not for adult consideration, Star Wars. It's goofy nonsense. Anyway, so I really quite love this novel because it, it's magical. Perhaps not for the young generation that grew up with the internet and smartphones. Like they probably don't know what it is like to be bored. And I mean bored in a, in a childish kind of a way. Like you wake up, you don't have any chores and you have a bicycle and that's the program. Jump on the bicycle and go in any direction. Say, Bye mom, I'm going out on my bicycle. God, my mother didn't even ever ask me like, which way are you going? I don't think today's generation of young people understand what it means to be bored. Like they say they're bored, but they're not because they've got instantaneous internet entertainment, nonstop flowing through their, you know, superficial periphery, what, like whatever it is that they're giving to these little machines. They've got it constantly. God, I'm so happy I grew up before all that. The young generation, they're really, really crippled when it comes to, you know, having this technology in front of their eyes all the time. Oh, well. So if you are in the mood for something that takes you back, way back to a much better world than the one we are living in today, before the world wars, almost before the industrial revolution, but the people are still recognizable. And a young man falls in love with a young woman. They lose contact. 
no email, and he obsesses, and he tries his damnedest to get back to her, but what happens when he does? Will they find true love? You'll have to read the book, and it is very much worth it. Sometimes it's just so nice to go back to, to rediscover the world. You know, it's so lost, it's so ancient, it's so foreign to our modern lives. This novel is only 207 pages, and it's fantastic. All right, time for the book lottery. If you support Grantlam's books for $5 a month on Patreon, I will put your name into this jar. There doesn't look like there's a lot of names left. Uh, there's a couple in there. Every week I write a weekly update blog about what is happening in my life, and I talk about my studies at university, which drive me to the edge of, of sanity, really. My tolerance for my university education is wearing so thin. So I write about that, so that's fun to read about, I hope. If you win the lottery, I will send you this very book, which is a little bit ancient, but that's what you get. And you also get a copy of my magazine, The Friend from Budapest by Grant Shipway, with my writing. I'll put those in an envelope, I'll mail it to you. You lucky devil, because that is limited edition. This is a work of pure, beautiful literature. So let's see which one of my lucky patrons will win those lovely prizes. I hope I'm saying this all right. Parastu, Parastu, Parastu from Montreal. Hey, you could actually read this book in the original French. You might want to because I, I just naturally assume that anything in the original language is better than the language it is translated into. I don't know that it could ever really happen that the translated version is better than the original. You know, the original is the one with all of the nuance. The translation, as perfect as it might get, is missing something, especially from French. You know, like with the male and female adjective, or not adjectives, the like possessive nouns, you know, table, chair, man, woman, you know, like that boggles my mind. Paris too. I'm going to send you this, I'm going to send you this, I'm going to put it into a nice envelope, and I'm going to send it to you in Montreal. Thank you very much for supporting the channel. I appreciate it. Thank you to all my patrons on Patreon who are supporting the channel. Thank you all very, very much. Sincerely, you are all very kind. All right, is that everything? Yeah, I think that's everything for today. Um... want to support the channel with a little cash, you can. And it's down there. I would be very appreciative because I'm a poor guy who <laughs> loves to read and just somehow I never really got that um, insatiable greed for money that a lot of other people seem to have that is a bit missing for me. I've got lots of books to read. Why do I need more money is sort of my general attitude, which... <sighs> Oh well, that's just me.